Hello and welcome to a very special, I don't even know what my hands are doing. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Bites of History with Irene Walton. I'm your host, Irene Walton. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. You guys, this is... A really special episode for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is our first ever sponsored episode. Thank you so much to Milk Pep for sponsoring this episode. You guys, I'm going to put their uh, website in the description. You have to check them out. Thank you so much to Milk Pep for sponsoring this. And hopefully we have some more time together in the future. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the second reason that this episode is so special and close to my heart is because we're talking about the history of Organic Valley today. If you guys know me or watch my channel or are ever on my Instagram, you know that I love Organic Valley. Um, they're a brand that I just really, really believe in. I've had some really incredible opportunities with. I think their story is really special and really, really worth sharing. And I think it's really going to be worth listening to. So... I, I'm just so beyond excited. Again, thank you to Milk Pep for sponsoring this episode. Thank you so much to my patrons. I love you guys so much. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, you can join for just $2 a month. There are tiers that go up from there, but starting at $2, you can hop into this little community we have going on. So thank you to all my patrons. And of course, thank you to my sources. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you to Orvin. Organic. Wow, what a great way to start this episode. <laughs> Thank you to organicvalley.coop. Thank you to wikipedia.org. Thank you to the Organic Valley YouTube channel, usda.gov, supermarketperimeter.com, dairyprocessing.com, and the Journal of Cleaner Production. Okay, you guys. Oh, this story is so cute and nice and fun and sweet and heartwarming. I hope you're ready. Buckle in. It's a joy. Come on. We're going to start with the history of Organic Valley. And just a little hint, uh, not a hint, but a fun little note. Their name has not always been Organic Valley. And we're going to talk about the hilarious story of where their name came from in just a minute. So to begin this history, we start in 1988 in rural Wisconsin. Wisconsin is definitely known for their farming, for their dairy, for their cows. But unfortunately, the agricultural system is going bankrupt. And if you are a small family farmer, this is really bad, scary news. And the only way for these small family farms to keep any income flowing was to quote unquote, go big or get out. Now, if you're wondering what that means exactly, I'll explain because I most certainly didn't. (laughs) The literal secretary of agriculture told these small family farmers, hey, you're not going to be able to keep up if you don't become a like either become a part of a conventional farm and sell your farm or acquire other small farms and become a big farm. So it was go big or get out, literally. And unfortunately, a lot of these small family farmers didn't know what to do. So they did sell their farms. And these small family farms were being told that the only way you could go was this conventional route. And for a lot of them, it didn't really feel right. But this was their job. This is their livelihood. They're feeding their families. They have to provide in some way. So They did it. They went big. And big agriculture definitely started to take over. But my man, George Seaman, said, I don't know about that. He said, Mama, no, thank you. (laughs) That is not a quote from George Seaman, but that's the sentiment around it. So what George did was put posters all over the Cooley region of Wisconsin calling small family farmers to come to this meeting at the Viroqua Courthouse so that they could talk about this and try to sort this out. And it was a packed house at Viroqua Courthouse. There was not a seat available. So the people in the Cooley region really cared. And so did George. George and all of these other small family farmers knew that Big farming wasn't right for them. It wasn't right for their families. It wasn't right for their animals. And it wasn't right for the earth. And it wasn't right for the people eating the food. And in this meeting at the Viroqua Courthouse, crop was born. Now that stands for Cooley Region Organic Produce Pool. So C-R-O-P-P. And it started with just seven organic farmers. So these were all types of farmers. We had produce farmers, dairy farmers, meat farmers, egg farmers, bunch of different kinds, but just seven farmers. And this was going to be a co-op. It was going to be a co-op to show all other co-ops how to do it. And if you, like myself, a couple of months ago, did not know fully what co-op meant, it just means that the farmers own and run the business. And before we continue on with the episode, I just want to share with you what the USDA, which is the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, I want to share with you what their 
definition of organic means. I want to share this because the word organic is going to come up a lot. So I want you to know exactly what I mean by it. USDA certified organic foods are grown and processed according to federal guidelines addressing, among many factors, soil quality, animal raising practices, pest and weed control, and the use of additives. Organic producers rely on natural substances and physical, mechanical, or biologically based farming methods to the fullest extent possible. So what this basically boils down to is organic doesn't allow the use of synthetic pesticides, herbicides, and GMOs. So that's what we mean by organic going forward, just so we all know. And also partially for me, because I needed the reminder. (laughs) Now, something really, really cool that I found out during my research was that CROP, the Cooley Region Organic Produce Pool, was actually really great in helping the USDA come up with these standards and come up with what organic meant. And it took a long time. It took about 10 years to make this happen. And they really helped the USDA do it. And I think that that's so cool that it's like a national standard now that they helped with. What a joy. Now, Organic Valley still does like go above and beyond these requirements. But anyway, we'll get (laughs) that's just my own personal bias where like I've seen how they treat their animals. And I'm like, this is a lot better than just normal organic. But whatever. Okay, so now in our timeline, just kind of rewinding uh, so we can continue like the history of OV. We're in 1989 and Crop purchases their first headquarters, which was an abandoned creamery in Lafarge, Wisconsin, which is I've been there. I went there this summer with Organic Valley and it is a tiny little town and I love it. It's very cute. It's very my vibe, but it is definitely maybe not the first place I would think of for headquarters. But Organic Valley said, we're here. We're in rural Wisconsin. We're sticking to it, baby. And I love that. Something I think is really interesting is these first employees of crop who were working at the headquarters, mama, they were making $5 an hour (laughs) for a couple of years, like a couple of years, they were making $5 an hour. And then after a few years, they had a really, really hefty pay bump to um, $7 an hour. (laughs) So (laughs) the CEO was making that much like it's, it was, it just kind of gives you it gives you a bit of an idea about who they are. So in this part of our timeline, crop members begin selling their dairy to customers. Like people are buying the organic dairy that's coming from the crop members. And people are getting really, really excited because these dairy products are fantastic. With this excitement over the crop dairy, other farmers started to get interested and started to take notice of like farming in a way that really mattered. And so crop started to expand and started to get other farmers. So it was, you know, adding on to the original seven. Now with that, The expansion's awesome, but their name was the Cooley Region, you know, Organic Produce Pool. So they were like, well, we got to change the name. And and one of the first employees of the company, my girl Harriet Bahar, said, I don't know, we should maybe just call it Organic Valley. (laughs) And she's literally quoted as saying like, yeah, it wasn't very interesting, but like, that's what it was. It was easy to remember. (laughs) And I love that. I personally think it's a perfect name for them. It's very honest and straightforward and to the point, just like they're farming, just like their products. They're like, we have great stuff. What what else do you want? (laughs) You know, I love it. Now, Organic Valley's cooperative model and fantastic products, if you haven't had their Munster cheese, you are missing out. It allowed them to rise as America's leading organic dairy cooperative, which is amazing that this little tiny baby town is just like making all this stuff happen. That's so beautiful. (laughs) And so now we're like in the nineties, we're expanding all over the place. And this really like hits home for me. The CEOs and the founding farmers go to every new small family farm who are being welcomed into the cooperative, knock on their door, check it out, talk with the people. And and like really get to know their farmers. And and I'll tell you right now, that has not changed. Like the amount that this cooperative knows their farmers is amazing. I just love the idea that like the CEO of Organic Valley would just like knock on your door and be like, hey, <laughs> can we check this out? <laughs> now in 2001, they hit $90 million in sales. I know it sounds like a lot and that's because it is. But remember, this is literally basically all going back to the farmers because it's a cooperative. So it's like this $90 million is just coming back to the farmers that are putting out the products. How 
cool is that? By 2002, we see something really special happen. Now, um, when dairy farmers get paid for their milk, it gets paid by the hundred pounds of milk. So, you know, like we would make uh, $10 an hour working at Starbucks. They, they make blank per hundred pounds of milk. In 2002, Organic Valley farmers are making $18.45 per hundred pounds compared to the $9.74 per hundred pounds that conventional dairy farmers were making. And when I was there in July, we went to uh, the Greta Beck farm, which is a small family dairy farm. And they told us the story of their first day on the truck. This is apparently something that every single Organic Valley farmer remembers is like the first time that that truck comes and picks up their milk and it's their first day on the truck and it's like their little special date. So from then, we just see Organic Valley still continuing and spreading its wings and spreading its reach to different places in the nation, welcoming in new small family farms into the cooperative with open arms and open hearts. And it's spreading all over the country. It goes from, you know, Wisconsin to Minnesota to Vermont to the East Coast, which stretches, you know, across the country and gets to the West Coast. Like they're picking up so many new family farms and welcoming them in. And that kind of brings us to where Organic Valley is today. So from humble beginnings and literally seven farmers, Organic Valley has grown in so many ways. Organic Valley now has 1,700 small family farms in its co-op and is in 35 states. Now, you guys, the sustainability part of what Organic Valley does truly blows my mind. Now, I want to be really honest with you guys. I am a bit of a, a fool when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I genuinely, and like not making a joke, I do hate to admit this, I really did kind of just like... I used to sort of turn my back on sustainability conversations and things like that and not really do much because I was so intimidated by the verbiage and the like gravity of what sustainability meant. And it felt it felt very um, unattainable to me. It felt very intimidating to me. So honestly, I sort of just like would tune out when people would talk about sustainability. And I'm not saying this because this is a sponsored episode. I'm not saying this because this is a company that really matters to me. I truly did not understand pretty much anything about sustainability until I went in July and learned about what Organic Valley is doing. Because wow, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> now we have to remember that Organic Valley farmers care about the animal, the planet, the product, and us, the consumer. And the symbiosis between the animal and the earth is especially interesting and really, really important to focus on. We've all heard somebody say that animal agriculture is a big contributor to carbon emissions, right? I've definitely heard people say that. But not the way Organic Valley does it, baby. Listen to this study. I'm going to read it word for word so you guys uh, could like be in astonishment with me. The University of Wisconsin's life cycle assessment. Now, just to let you know, a life cycle assessment studies the impact of animal agriculture from start to finish not the animal itself. So not like the life cycle of a cow, it's like the life cycle of the farming process. The University of Wisconsin's life cycle assessment found greenhouse gas emissions to be 24% lower on Organic Valley dairy farms as compared to conventional US averages, due in large part to carbon sequestration benefits of organic pastures. Mama, when I tell you what carbon sequestration is, Listen, if I could whistle, I would. <laughs> okay, carbon sequestration can break off into a couple different realms. So we're going to break it down a little bit. There's carbon offsetting and there's carbon insetting. Carbon insetting is so cool. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. Let's start with carbon offsetting. Both of these insetting and offsetting are both good things. I want to make that very clear. However, pop up. It gets a little juicy here. <laughs> Irene's hot take on carbon offsetting. It is a good thing that's happening for sure. However, carbon offsetting is where a company will buy credits to basically attain a carbon neutral status. Now, what that means is they're 
buying plots of land somewhere in like South Africa or something, planting a bunch of plants and stuff so that the carbon is getting sequestered in those plants. It's technically, you know, like a lot of airlines do this. So like an airline can attain carbon neutral status tomorrow if they buy enough of these plots of land, which give them these like credits that allow them to say, yeah, we put carbon out into the world, but we're also scooping it back up with these plants that we've planted all over these different plots of land in like South Africa. Again, it's not a bad thing because they are still doing good, but they're not changing anything about about their own practices to like really get the picture. <laughs> you know what I mean? And also a lot of times you guys, the I I am so revved up about this. I'm so excited. A lot of times the plants that are being planted are like invasive species. So they're like planting weeds basically because they are they're plants. They're taking carbon in. It, it's basically just paying somebody to do something good for you. <laughs> like the good thing is still being done. It just may not be the best way to do it. And also you're not changing your habits. But still, we we stand carbon sequestration in any realm. However, mama, let me tell you about carbon insetting. Oh, carbon insetting is so incredible and so cool and so fun and so flirty and so fresh. Carbon insetting is where you are planting good plants that are native to the environment and good for the soil and good for your animals. And these, these, you know, native species that the farmers know, the farmers know what to plant because they've been doing this for generations. They know what's good for their cows. They know what's good for their chickens. They know what's good for their soil. And it, it's just good for everybody. It's also great for biodiversity, which we'll get into in a second. But carbon, do you guys see the difference? It's like carbon insetting is, it's these farmers taking action and making the change to do better and sequester more carbon in a way that's beneficial to them and the earth and the plants and the cows and us and the dairy. It's so cool. Now, Organic Valley actually pays their farmers to do this. They say, hey, you guys know what you're doing. You've been doing this for generations. Plant the plants that are good. Start carbon insetting. We'll pay you for it. And it's also great that Organic Valley does it this way and its farmers do it this way because this type of carbon insetting, like, it's so good for everything. It's It can provide, like, when they plant certain trees, it provides shade for their animals. It also provides, like, pasture boundaries. So, like, um you know, instead of having gates and like a ton of gates and everything, they'll have some trees that tell them like, oh, this is where the cows go on Monday. This is where the cows go on Tuesday, like to, you know, just section it off like naturally. So amazing. And it's also really good for water absorption. Something that like I am not familiar with because I live in Los Angeles is like when they get a lot of rain, these trees soak it all up. Not all of it, but a lot of it. That's awesome. (laughs) I don't even know what rain is. So anyway, what you can think of it as is like carbon offsetting is paying someone to do good stuff for you. And what you can think of carbon insetting as is doing the good stuff yourself. So they're both good. Anytime we're scooping up some carbon, great. (laughs) But if you can do it in a way that's cool and good for you and your, you know, plants and animals, why not? Okay. And if you guys couldn't tell sustainability is like their number one priority. They have like eight number one priorities, (laughs) but this is a big one. (laughs) Their headquarters that I visited in July has like a Tony Stark level of sustainability intelligence. I'll tell you what. They harvest sunlight for electricity. They use wind turbines for electricity. With all this electricity that they're harvesting from the literal sun, they're not just, you know, providing it for their headquarters. They provide electricity to 10,000 homes that are around the headquarters. That's awesome. That's so cool, dude. (laughs) And it's also, um, the headquarters is also heated by a geothermal well. What is that? I don't even know. I had to ask them. Basically, the earth has a stable core temperature. So the heat that comes into the headquarters is just from the earth. They're doing it. They're doing something right over there. I'll tell you what. (laughs) We're moving on to maybe my favorite part. Well, I don't know. I've been really enjoying this whole podcast. (laughs) My face like hurts from smiling. I'm so happy to be doing this. Thank you guys for listening. We're moving on to the part of the episode where I remind you that dairy is not scary. Now to anyone with genuine dairy allergies or intolerances, 
this part is not for you. I'm not talking to you. I totally get it. I won't want my tummy to hurt either. But to anyone else who is subbing their milk out for almond or oat or pea or macadamia or rice or soy or any other milk alternative, stop. Stop it. <laughs> stop that. <laughs> I'm giving you permission. I'm telling you right now, you can get dairy milk. You can. I go to a little local Bristol Farms. I get my little latte. They say, what milk? I say, cow, baby. Give me that sweet, sweet OV whole milk, mama. And let me tell you something. It's delicious. <laughs> dairy, dairy is not your enemy. Do you want a delicious bowl of cereal? You're going to need milk for that. Do you, want a little, do you want a little ice cream to end your night with? You're going to need milk for that. Do you want a coffee that's delicious and rich and full and doesn't leave some weird film on the side of your cup and tastes watery? You're going to need milk for that. You guys, I am urging you to try, try milk again. Give milk another shot. I think you just forgot how much you miss it because, oh, I got it right here, baby. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. Oh, look at that color. Oh. I love milk. I challenge you to get your iced latte or iced coffee or maybe just a glass of milk. Have you had a glass of milk recently? <laughs> I challenge you to do this and tell me it's not a million times better. Anyway, that's my rant about milk and how you should drink it. But now to remind you of why it's important to drink it, let me let me tell you something really cute and really sweet. And it sort of made me tear up when I read it. Since Organic Valley doesn't put any toxic pesticides into the food system, which is like waterways, soil, manure, et cetera, there's no toxicity. Um, it literally rebuilds biodiversity and biodiversity is like endangered birds and butterflies and bees. Like it's really helping. It's so cool. <laughs> Now we're going to move on to where Organic Valley is going and their future. You guys, by 2050, Organic Valley plans on being completely carbon neutral. That means whatever carbon they put out into, you know, the world, they're able to sequester it the equal amount with carbon insetting, because I don't know if you guys remember, but carbon insetting is sick as hell. So that's just a really beautiful thing. And it, it, yeah, it sounds like it's a bit away, but also, you know, 2000 was 22 years ago somehow. But anyway, it's a, it's a really huge thing that they can do that because they could just buy it tomorrow. They could carbon offset and just buy their carbon neutral status, but they're really working towards actually doing it. And I think that's really special. Organic Valley has saved over 1,700 family farms, and they don't plan on stopping ever. This is their mission and their love and their life, and they're really good at it. It's really special to see. <laughs> and I wanted to share just one last little bit of information about Organic Valley and the work that they do and, you know, the the beauty that they provide this world. As recently as this year, um, there were 60 family farms that were promised to be picked up by other organic labels. And they were dropped and they, the labels just said, no, sorry, we're not taking you on organic Valley. Oh my God. I'm, I'm getting like teary eyed because <laughs> I could just like imagine how, well, let me tell you what happened and then we can cry about it. Organic Valley welcomed them into the co-op and said, we got you. And I, I just can't imagine like what a relief and what a joy that must have been for these small family farms that thought they were going somewhere. And then it was said, no, sorry, whoopsies, like, no, ma'am. And then Ovi said, hey, baby, hop in. <laughs> now, if we had more time, we could talk about the logistics that went into having to literally change the routes of these big, gigantic trucks in rural Wisconsin to find these small, tiny family farms and go pick up their milk. Like, that's a lot of work so much work that I can't even comprehend it. So that's why we're not fully getting into it. But that's so intense and so special and so beautiful. And that's just like a little bit of the magic that Organic Valley is. It's just an honor to know them and to be friends with them. I, like I feel like I'm friends with this whole co-op, <laughs> which I mean, I am when you meet the people who work there. It's like, Everybody there is just is wonderful. And to try their products is to know them and to know them is to love them. And uh, I hope this episode gave you a little bit of insight into why I am so beyond fatal for Organic Valley. And yes, this episode is sponsored. Thank you again, Milk Pep. But 
it is my joy and my privilege and my honor to get to share with you the magical story that is OV. Uh, so I really, I urge you to go out, try some Organic Valley products. You get it. <laughs> you know what? I could just, I could go on and on, but you know what I mean. You guys, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to Milk Pep for sponsoring this episode. I hope you have the best day. Drink a lot of water. Drink some milk. Have a bowl of ice cream. You guys, such a joy to talk to you. Thank you for listening. And next week, we're going to be talking about the history of Trader Joe's. So make sure you tune in for that, too. I love you guys so much. Have the best day. Goodbye. <laughs>